All right, so let's begin our uh, jaunt into physiology here. Uh, this will give you an introduction to what physiology is and kind of the basics of what we're going to be looking at this most of the semester. Um, we'll end this with uh, talking about homeostasis and uh, feedback loops that keep us homeostatic. All right, and that's going to be most of the gist of the semester is looking at how the body keeps homeostasis because um, that keeps the normal functioning in the body since our physiology is what is it? it is our normal functioning okay physiology normal functioning and living cells so we're going to look how these cells operate you already learned the structures how they are formed and how they're put together all these cells put together and then put into tissues and then tissues into organs and so forth given our levels of organization but now we're going to look at how these cells actually function how they relate to each other and so it's very integrative okay because you have all these organ systems in anatomy you learned organ systems hey let's look at the digestive tract let's look at the urinary let's look at the um, respiratory but what you're going to see in physiology is these all are interrelated to keep what we call homeostasis okay so our normal functioning we got many chemical processes so we have to deal with chemistry we'll do that in our next lecture and physical pro properties physics in that regards and so some of those like i said rooted in chemistry and physics um, you got the heart like a pump creating pressures Pressures pushing, causing a pushing force. That's our physics. A lot of our chemistry. Okay, we're going to be talking about chemical reactions, reactions that are taking place, because this is how the cells operate and how we keep this thing that we call homeostasis. Okay, so again, we got to look at chemistry. We got physical properties. Um, I know chemistry is not a. Some of you have had it. Some of you have not. But um, when we get to the chemistry portion, I try to keep it to the nuts and bolts of chemistry and kind of keep it to what we're focusing on. But um, you've got to learn chemistry. Okay. Um, I've already touched on how this is different from anatomy in my intro uh, video. But you got to realize that anatomy, you learn an organ system. You memorize, 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 memorize. In physiology, you are learning concepts. And at the beginning, we're going to be learning concepts that biological concepts that you will be using and chemical concepts too that you will be using throughout the semester. So this beginning stuff, you need to get it nailed down because otherwise you're just going to be relearning it over and over throughout the semester. Okay, so make sure when we get to the chemistry, you're very solid on it because we're going to be seeing it over and over again because that is how these cells of these organ systems operate. Membrane transport is another thing um, that is you've got to get these concepts down. Okay so this beginning stuff you really want to get it solidified so when we start jumping into the other organ systems you don't have to keep relearning these concepts. Okay but again they're going to be rooted in chemistry and a lot of physics. Okay. Uh, another branch of physiology, pathophysiology, uh, there's another course dealing with this, but this is when homeostasis that we'll be talking about doesn't take place. That's when we get diseases and injury. So pathophysiology, okay, I will focus on a few diseases to try to help pinpoint what's going wrong with the actual physiology the actual normal functioning to give you guys a better grasp on the actual physiology okay but pathophysiology is another branch dealing with disease states so let's talk levels of organization this should look familiar to your anatomy days you've probably seen some version of this but we got at the most simplest we have atoms and molecules, the chemistry portion. Okay, atoms are put together into molecules. Molecules are put together to make up cells. 
and then cells are put together to form tissues and then multiple tissues are put together to form organs and then multiple organs will make an organ system and ultimately those organ systems make the organism okay in anatomy you were dealing a lot with this portion you got maybe down to the cellular level for the most part so you spent a lot of time up in these upper regions during anatomy okay we in physiology because we're looking at the function we're looking at how the cells operate and they operate through chemical ways we're going to be focused more down in this region for physiology and therefore that is why you need to have that chemistry okay already said atoms make molecules cells cells is the smallest living unit and then multiple cells bring us to tissues and then does anybody remember your four tissues we'll go over a little bit i'm just going to go over briefly because a lot of this tissue stuff and organs and organ system stuff is stuff that should be carried over from anatomy so i'm going to probably run through it fairly quickly so that if you forget the graphs of these tissues these um, organs and so forth you may want to go back and review that because um, I will just be running through quickly because we got to jump into the physiology portion okay tissues organs and organ system so let's look through our tissues again we're going to be focused more on the cellular level and the molecular level, but we have got 36 trillion cells and they're all basically one of these tissues. They're either epithelial. Do you guys remember epithelial are those coverings? Your skin covers line your digestive tract. They're, the key about the epithelial is they're basically our interface with the outside environment so they're going to be important when we start talking homeostasis because for us to operate we got to have interaction between the external environment so epithelial tissues we will be looking at a lot of this how the cells operate in different epithelial tissues connective tissue that's the glue okay we don't focus a lot on the connective tissue because they're kind of the glue and filler um, but we will be touching on muscle tissue hopefully you remember the three muscle tissues we got the cardiac the um, smooth and the skeletal all right we'll be dealing with all three of those and then the nervous tissue those neurons but we'll see neurons and glia cells so we're going to look spend a lot of time on how this nervous tissue operates how it's organized and the different components of the nervous system. Okay, so let's look at epithelial. We said the lining and coverings, also glands. So we will be all those organs of the endocrine system that we will be focusing on and how they operate are epithelial tissues. Okay, the functions physical pr protection diffusion and filtration so we're looking at the urinary system secretion absorption okay. again urinary absorption urinary and digestive tract sensation so we're talking nervous system and and ion transport again these epithelial tissues are our interface with the external environment and so therefore they are very important in getting stuff out and into the body. We got to um, cross a layer of epithelial to get either in or out of the body. So the connective tissue, right, that's our structural. Okay, let's just not say it's stagnant, but it's kind of the glue or filler. So it's not going to be focused on a lot through the physiology. We'll be Spending a lot of time epithelial, muscle, and um, nervous system. 
If you remember what makes it unique is it has typically has that extensive extracellular matrix, which differed from the epithelial, which is cell up next to cell next to cell. And then our muscle, and I already touched base on, we got our skeletal muscle with those striations. Those striations contain those contractile elements that allow the muscle to contract. Okay. Skeletal allows for movement. Cardiac muscle. Okay, we'll be focusing on them because we will be doing multiple chapters dealing with the heart. And then smooth muscle. Okay, smooth muscles, some of the main places, we line the blood vessels. This is actually going to help in regulating our blood pressure. Smooth muscle also helps in moving of materials through our digestive tract. So we will also be touching on the smooth muscle and how they operate. And finally, my favorite, the neural tissue. Okay. We're going to see that there has to be some kind of command center for the body to help organize those 36 trillion cells. And one of the main players in this is this nervous tissue. Okay, the neurons allow for communications across long distances. So we will spend a good amount of time on the nervous system. Um, basically, we have a whole chapter or whole exam on the nervous system and a couple of the um, couple of the organizations of the nervous tissue okay so we're spending a good amount of time looking at how each individual operates and how some of the different divisions actually operate okay but everybody thinks nervous system neurons because those are those ones that allow for communication but the helper cells and the ones that help support and make sure and they're actually more numerous than the neurons are the glia cells to make sure these cells can operate. As you imagine, these cells are microscopic in scope. They can be up to three feet long. So they're gonna need a lot of help to make sure that they can function properly over these long distances. Okay, and that's gonna be one of the functions of those glia cells. Make sure the environment around the neuron is supported so, or staying constant so the neurons can operate. Um, right. And so we put tissues together to make an organ. Okay, you can see multiple tissues. The skin, using an example, we got the epithelial, the connective tissue, muscle and nervous, all four tissues are involved in making that organ the skin, right? And then we put multiple organs together to make up our organ systems. Okay, here's our digestive. We got multiple organs, and esophagus, stomach, pancreas. Hopefully these all look familiar from your anatomy days. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the organ organ systems. These should be stuff you already know from your anatomy days, right? To, but if you've been a while or you forgot, you might want to go back and just do a quick review on these, on the organ organ systems, um, just to get your bearings straight as we move through here. All right, an overview of all those organ systems we got the circulatory we got the digestive the endocrine the immune integumentary muscle musculoskeletal nervous reproductive respiratory and urinary okay we will be spending we will looking at the function of these and we're also going to be because we're dealing with physiology this is integrative we're going to have to integrate and look at how some of these systems influence each other or have integration with each other okay the only one we will not 
be focused on will be the integumentary. Okay, otherwise we're going to be breaking down. We have a lectures dealing with circulatory, digestive, endocrine, immune, musculoskeletal, nervous, reproductive, respiratory, and urinary. Okay, we'll be breaking those down. We'll be looking at the cells. We'll be looking at how they function and what their function is to basically help create homeostasis in the body, in the organ. I'm sorry, organism. Some themes of physiology. You probably already heard structure goes along with function. Okay. Your organs are created in a way so they function in the function that they need to do. Like we said with our nervous system. Our nervous system microscopic, but they can be long, almost a meter long in length. Okay. This allows for long distance communication. If the nervous systems were small, or the neurons were small or only small length, we would have to have multiple neurons, so we'd have to pass a signal to each of these cells. Whereas if we stimulate this one neuron that's stretched over this long distance, we can get this rapid communication. So we get the structure follows the function. Okay. That's well, for molecular interactions, which we're going to be talking a lot with chemistry, compartmentalization. We'll be talking about here shortly on how we get compartmentalized so we can get the cells can function and have a compartment in which they function and allow them to function properly. Living organisms need injury, or sorry, not injury, energy. And this we will focus on when we start talking about metabolism and cellular respiration. We'll be looking how the cells are able to eat. Uh, meet those energy needs okay we will be information flow coordinates function throughout the body anybody guess what two systems I probably will be talking about here by the more obvious the nervous system okay the nervous system is going to be a massive coordinator of all these other tissues all these other organ systems that we'll be talking about and the other is endocrine system the endocrine and the nervous system are kind of those that coordinate and have flow of information to help coordinate all these organ systems so everybody's on board so the body is homeostatic and the cells can all function properly okay, and then what we're going to be spending most of our semester is how do these organ systems how do they operate to keep homeostasis to maintain this internal stability okay the cells our little cells they don't like huge fluctuations going on outside in these they're basically bathed in the solution if there's huge fluctuations in the solution they're not going to be able to operate properly so we have to keep this environment somewhat stable around the cells inside the cells so the cells can operate and that process of keeping that internal stability is termed homeostasis so as we are already alluded to or what i alluded to was homeostasis what is it okay it's ability to keep internal environment relatively stable constant okay we have all these things going on in the environment. We can walk in, say, have you ever gone to Costco when you get into that cold refrigerator, that freezer thing? You're nice and warm, and all of a sudden you walk into that freezer and you're freezing. You that makes changes. That external change changes can if you don't make any changes, your body temperature is going to go down. And you need to keep your body temperature relatively stable. For our cells to function properly okay so you have to make these changes and that's what basically homeostasis is how do we regulate this internal environment you can see in a fish you have these large external fluctuations 
Okay, but there's small internal fluctuations. The key is, is in the ocean, in the big ocean, this usually this external, this big sea that they're in stays fairly stable. Us here, terrestrial and uh, organisms, okay, we have rapid changes. Okay, water temperature doesn't go down as rapidly. It's hard to get change in 30 degrees in a large body of water, but in the terrestrial in the air we can get changes of 30 degrees so it's very important that we are able to maintain this internal environment so essentially we have a sea inside our body okay we have these fluids these internal fluids that are almost like our little ocean and the key is is that it's small it's not like a giant sea so small fluctuations can make big changes in this sea that we have in our body okay there's extracellular fluid that we'll be talking about okay so we have to have the ability to maintain this environment okay we eat a lot of salt right if you threw say a handful of salt in the ocean it's all gonna fuse out and it's not gonna make this great change in the ocean but if you throw that same salt and you eat it it's going to have a big change in the fluids in your body. Okay, so we have to have the ability to maintain. And so we spend a lot of energy maintaining this and keeping that internal environment stable, which is called homeostasis. Okay, and our organ systems function in a way to make sure homeostasis is kept. So these cells in our body have this nice constant see around them so they can function properly okay it's not so much i guess i keep using the word constant it's not a set point but it's dynamic it is moving up and down but it's not moving boom way up boom way down it's moving within this range this homeostatic range so it is dynamic it's not constant per se there is this range okay but again it's not way up here and it's not way down here we're staying relatively close to what we call a set point that keeps us in homeostasis okay. and here's kind of how here's how homeostasis and basically disease relates okay it's hard because this is covered up by my face here but you guys have it on your PowerPoint okay the body organism homeostasis external change internal change okay I like to use external change say something's taking you guys are up in big bear we're having a good time having a few drinks and your friends say i i dare you to go out into the out into the snow in your underwear all right you go out there and what happens it's external change causes an internal change we want to keep our temperature within a certain range around 7 37 degrees celsius Okay. If we go out in the cold air and we start losing heat, internal heat, our internal temperature is going to go down. Okay. Organism tries to compensate. You have some brown fat that can create energy. You also can use your muscles. You start shivering, which also creates heat. Okay. But if you're out there for a long period of time, what's going to happen? Are you going to be able to compensate for this change? probably not you can get compensation fails okay you can get illness and disease okay you're more likely to get a uh, cold or so forth because you've dropped your temperature your organ systems aren't working properly or worst case scenario you could have organ failure or get frostbite because your body's trying to maintain, maintain this internal temperature okay. 
what if you're able to run around and run around and if you're running you also create more heat the more you move your body the more heat you produce and if you're not out there for a long period of time you may be able to produce enough heat to keep your internal temperature okay up and then you would stay homeostatic okay but that's kind of how it relates if you're not able to maintain that homeostasis that's where you start falling in the disease state and worst case scenario into death okay so homeostasis is important if you're successfully able to compensate for these changes either external or internal changes taking place okay you stay homeostatic you can stay healthy you fail to compensate for these external or internal changes then you wind up with illness or disease you fall within that pathophysi pathophysiology portion so let's talk on fluid compartments like I said these cells our cells are bathed in solutions okay solutions basically what do we got we got a solvent and a solute we'll talk a little bit more about those in chemistry but you have salt dissolved in the solution you have proteins you have all these different ions around the cell okay the fluid in the body outside of the cell is the extracellular fluid okay that's the c within the body i'm talking about that's a c we have to keep relatively stable okay within that dynamic range not too high not too low we want to keep all these components stable so the cell can operate okay the ecf is essentially the bridge between the external environment and your cells if you think about it your most of your cells do they have access to the external environment no they're internal they're not even like cells that are in my gut they have no access to the outside environment okay so they require that this ecf extracellular fluid that surrounds it stays safe or sorry stays relatively stable okay that's the c that bathes these cells okay the intracellular fluid that is the fluid inside the cells the icf okay like we said these cells don't have outside access to the external environment so they can exchange materials with the external environment to keep themselves operating they're required that this solution this ecf maintains and constancy to make sure they can operate so you can say the ecf is kind of the transition between the external environment and the intracellular fluid that resides inside the cell and can anybody tell me what extracellular fluid actually comprises of two components think about the blood is extracellular fluid the blood plasma also the cells are bathed in this fluid that is called the interstitial fluid in between the cells okay but those both comprise of the ECF. You can think, what do we pick up? Most of our materials are nutrients we pick up, the oxygen we breathe in. First, it is brought into the blood. The blood can bring it to wherever it needs to go, and then the blood transports it to the extracellular fluid, and now the cell can use those nutrients or gases if need be so you can see how this extracellular fluid is basically the transition or the contact between the extracellular environment or the external environment with the intracellular fluid of the cells
Let me see. Very sad. Inter ICF. You may hear me say ICF. If I say ICF, it's intracellular fluid. That's the cell. That's the fluid inside the cell. The ECF outside the cell, and like I said, it consists of two. Consists of the blood plasma here, and then the interstitial fluid is the purple. It's the fluid that surrounds the cell. Okay, and so you can see this is the transition between the cells and the external environment because we pick stuff up in the blood, transfer it to the interstitial fluid, and then the cells can use what's around it in the interstitial fluid. Okay, opposite, if the cells create waste, how do we get? We go the opposite direction and the cells create waste, Put it in the interstitial fluid, then it gets picked up in the blood, and the blood brings it, say, to the urinary system so we can expel it to the external environment. So, this is how the ECF is a transition between the extracellular, or sorry, the external environment and the internal environment of the cells. So what we can see in homeostasis, there's a theory called mass and balance, the law of mass balance. Okay, amount of substance in the body remains constant, relatively constant, stable within this dynamic range. So if we put something in, something's got to come out. Okay, we drink a ton of water. What happens when you drink a ton of water? No change. If you were completely dehydrated you've been in the desert and you've been completely dehydrated you've lost a ton of water maybe not so much will happen but if you sit in sitting at the computer watching this video and you're drinking water cup of water after cup of water what happens you have to start running to the bathroom because the input's got to match it with the output okay if we brought in water and didn't get rid of it we would our solution our blood would become highly dilate or diluted and also would increase our blood volume which we'll see later on will increase our blood pressure so we got to match what's coming in with what is lost okay you can see kind of this bounce here input to output let's let's use the lungs we'll get all these involved here input the lungs the lungs bring in oxygen okay what's that oxygen used for it's used for metabolism to a new substance okay carbon dioxide is formed when we do metabolism right that's an input into this the metabolic production so what do we if we Bring in oxygen and we start producing lots of carbon dioxide. Can we just allow the oxygen to be used in carbon dioxide, this metabolic production, to keep building up? No, eventually we have to get rid of it, and that's where we have to output it. So input always has to equal the output, so we keep this balance. Okay, otherwise, right, we're trying to keep factors homeostatic. If we just keep inputting, we're going to be raising that factor more and more and more. Okay, we're trying to keep this balance. One thing to note, homeostasis. Yes, we want to stay within this dynamic range, but homeostasis doesn't equal what we call equilibrium all right we're going to see later on in the extracellular fluid okay what is homeostatic compared to what's homeostatic inside the cell look at these two ions we got sodium and we got chloride okay 
This is the extracellular fluid. This is what's outside the cell. Okay. You can see the concentrations, the amount of sodium, the amount of chloride in the solution, in the ECF, what's dissolved in the solution of these ions is relatively high. Now look at, except for my big head is in the way here, if we looked at the same concentrations of these two ions inside the cell, you see they are rather very, very low. This is homeostatic. It is homeostatic to have ions high outside and these sodium and chloride low inside. If they were to reach equilibrium, your nervous system would not operate. You would not be able to send signals through your nervous system. Okay, you would have no way of communication. There would be much, you'd probably be dead at that point if it ever became equal. Okay, so you wouldn't even have to worry about the nervous system. All your cells would be. So the cells, what's homeostatic is to keep this discrepancy, to keep this difference is homeostatic. It's not equal. Okay, we want ions high outside, or well, sodium and chloride high outside, and sodium chloride low inside the cell. Okay, so we've already talked chemical disequilibrium. Okay, many times the fluid compartments are different chemically, difference in ions. You see, there's also a difference in calcium. Or sorry, not calcium, potassium. K is potassium. Okay, it's the opposite. Low outside, high inside the cell. Okay, that's the chemical disequilibrium. When we get to the nervous system, and even all cells, but we utilize this, what we call membrane potential. We utilize this electrical disequilibrium. Okay, inside the cell is more negative compared to outside the cell. That is homeostatic. If we reached equilibrium in electrical membrane potential, again, your nervous system would not be able to operate. Okay, so homeostatic is disequilibrium. We will see osmolarity, osmotic. This has to do with the total amount of solutes in the solution outside the cell and the total amount of solutes inside the cell. We can see in this case homeostasis is equal to equilibrium. So we do want them equal. Okay, if you get too far in one direction on either of these, you're going to have some serious problems. And we're going to see this when we start talking membrane transport and osmolarity. Okay, we want the Amount of dissolved stuff inside the cell equal to the total amount of dissolved stuff outside the cell. So we do want equilibrium to be homeostatic in that case. Okay, but it doesn't always, homeostasis doesn't always equal equilibrium. Usually if we were in class, I'd be asking you, talk with a group, hey, what va variables? We already talked about core body temperature, ion concentrations. We looked at those, okay, or in a homeostatic oxygen carbon dioxide, okay, osmolarity. There are many factors that are in these control. Now there is blood pressure, okay, oxygen, Carbon dioxide levels we got there. These are all variables that your body actively manipulates to keep them in a homeostatic range. Yeah. How is this done? Okay, control systems. We have these control systems that regulate okay we have organs systems 
set up in a way that they operate to maintain this homeostasis. Okay, we want to regulate the variables so they don't stray too far from that set point. We don't want them going way high or way low. Okay, so your body is arranged. It has these arrangements, these control system arrangements that help maintain these variables. Okay, and there's two basic forms of control. There's local control. You see this occurs at basically locally at the tissue. And there's long distance reflex control. And we'll see two main players in this. You think, how are we able to communicate over long distances? Endocrine system and nervous system will help regulate this long distance reflex control. Okay. So local control, very simple. You can see this response loop is much smaller than this long distance response loop, okay, but we'll look at how these variables are regulated either locally or through these long distance reflex control. So let's look at the simplest form of this control mechanism and that's local control and it's going to occur locally at the tissue level. It's going to be isolated so it doesn't happen body-wide, it just happens at a location in the body, an isolated location. Okay, it's usually controlled by the tissue in that region. Um, an example of this, well first let's look at the three components that make up this local control and there's three basic components, an input signal, an integrating center, an output signal that will get us a response to basically counteract what's taking place in the input signal. Okay, an example of this is basically local blood control. There are these arterioles that can vasodilate or vasoconstrict to control the amount of blood flow to a certain region. Okay, constricting would cause less blood flow, dilation would cause more blood flow. Okay, there are tissue, there are cells that line these vessels in various locations in the body. Say there is a low level of oxygen to the muscles in, the, in my shoulder here. Those cells okay, get an input signal. The input signal is oxygen levels are low. Those cells would be the integrating center because they're going to sense, hey, oxygen levels are low and they're going to release these vasodilating substances, molecules, okay? And that would be the output signal. The output signal would cause, because they're vasodilating, cause the vessels to dilate. And what would we get? We'd get more blood flow and we would get more oxygen to that region, okay? Once the oxygen levels are within a certain range, right, we won't have this input signal anymore, okay? And that would shut this off. This is local control. Again, low oxygen levels, the signal, the cells that line the blood vessels that have those vasodilating, that can release those vasodilating molecules are the integrating center and the vasodilating molecules are the output signal to get a response of vasodilation. Okay, so this is pretty basic, just three components. We'll see with this longer control, when we start using the nervous system or the um, endocrine system, it gets more complex with these response loops. There's more components to it. Okay, so this reflex con control can occur over long distances. Remember, we're using neurons that can be really long or endocrine system can use the whole blood system so it can basically have targets that are all over the body so it can have very long distance signaling so it can also be very broad in range not local like the local control okay and there are two components to these response there's a response loop and 
a feedback loop okay the feedback loop because remember if we get a response to help bring us say bring a variable up at some point we need to shut that response down so the variable doesn't go too high and so that's going to be the function of the feedback loop the response loop is going to allow us to respond to whatever change the feedback loop make sure that the response is not too drastic okay. so let's look at these more complex loops okay you can see there are seven steps seven parts to this response loop they're always going to begin with the stimulus. What change is taking place, either externally or internally? We have to have something that can measure this change, that can sense it. So that's the function of the sensor. Okay, the sensor can send whatever it senses through the input signal and send it to the integrating center. The integrating center is going to take that information, determine whether it needs to do an output signal to get a response at some tissue. Okay, because what we're trying to do is we get a change, we wanna say something's going too low, we wanna counteract that change to bring it back up. So we have to have a target, we have to have a tissue that can help bring that variable back up. Okay. So integrating system says, hey, variable is going low. I'm going to send out an out output signal to a target that's going to allow me to bring that variable back up. Okay. The negative, this should be negative or feedback loop. Then modulate the response loop. Okay. We're going to see there's negative feedback and positive feedback. But to keep us homeostatic, we're going to want a negative feedback loop. But let's look at our example here. Okay, our stimulus. Our stimulus is water temperature is low. Okay, the sensor, number two, the sensor is a thermometer. The thermometer senses, hey, water temperature is decreasing. Okay, we've set the thermostat in the aquarium to a set point. Okay. Remember our homeostasis is within dynamic range. So it's not gonna stay constant. Okay, say we have it at 27 degrees. It's not gonna be exactly at 27 degrees, but say we decrease to 26. Now we wanna start bringing it back up. Now we can bring it up 27, starts climbing to 28. We don't wanna to go too far, so now we gotta bring it back down. But in this instance, we're talking about water temperature has dropped out of range say we have the thermostat set well in this case we have it set to maintain at 30 the water temp's gone down to 25 the thermometer can sense is a sensor in this case and now we're going to the wires the input signal to the control box control box controls whether the heater is on or off a control box gets a signal, that input signal from the thermometer, temperature is low. All right, the output is to turn the heater on. The target in this case is the coil here, the heater coil. Okay, output signal, turn on, heater turns on, and what happens to the water? The water starts to climb. Since it looks like we had a drop of five degrees, set our so let's say we start raising the temperature temperature goes up we reach 35 degrees do we want to keep this heater on now we're starting to get in the high range so once we're in that range we're starting to climb up to that 35 degrees that is what the feedback the feedback loop says hey tells the thermometer hey we're within this range and then the thermometer can send, hey, water temperature is starting to get up to 35. And that will cause the integrating center to do the opposite. Shut down. Turn off the heater. Okay, so that is the negative. The feedback loop helps modulate. So we're not going too high. Also, we don't want it going too low. Okay, once we turn it off, and what happens? 
water gets cold again, now we gotta turn it back on. Okay, so feedback loops helps keep us from going too high or too low in these instances. I'm gonna give you a physiological example of this um, to give you guys an idea how this actually works in the body. Okay, negative feedback loops are, so that is a negative feedback loop. It's shutting off the original, okay, shutting off the response so we don't go too high or too low. Negative feedback loops are homeostatic. They keep us within this range. We're going to see positive feedback loops. Positive feedback loops are actually non-homeostatic. They actually ramp up the original response. Okay, but we'll take a look at those in just a second. Let's look at what we call the baroreceptor reflex. This helps regulate blood pressure in your body. Okay, we have a set point of blood pressure. We don't want blood pressure to go too high because we have these nice little delicate vessels in the brain that can burst. Right, we don't want it too low because we got to make sure we get enough oxygen to the tissue. If it gets too low, we can get dizzy and so forth in our brain. Okay, so we keep this blood pressure within this dynamic range. And one of the ways to do that is through this response loop, this baroreceptor reflex loop. Okay, these response loop. First begins with the stimulus. In this case, our stimulus is blood pressure is increasing above our set point. So what do we want to do? We want to bring the blood pressure back down. That's the response we want to get. Okay. We have these baroreceptors. You have these baroreceptors on the on your aorta and on your carotid artery. They're responding to stretch. When blood pressure increases, they get more stretch. And so these sensors can send signals through the afferent neurons. Remember, afferents going from outside, bringing it into the central nervous system. And we have regions of the brain, cardiac centers in the brain, that receive these inputs from the baroreceptor. Okay, the cardiac centers are the integrating center. They're going to integrate, hey, I'm getting signals of low blood pressure. And what are they going to do? They can send out an output signal. In this case, the afferent neurons can sing, send the signal down to the target tissue. What are some, we have high blood pressure. What are some target tissues that can help lower what we can get a response in certain tissues that will help lower our blood pressure okay we have blood vessels when our blood vessels are constricted the pressure is higher when the blood pressures or blood vessels dilate that lowers blood pressure also our heart we can lower our heart rate we can also lower how much blood is being pushed out in the system or what we call our contractility those can be controlled. In this case, since blood pressure is high, we want to lower our heart rate and lower the force that the heart is pushing out blood. Okay, so those the output signals can go to the heart and the blood vessels to get us a response that helps lower the blood pressure. Okay, do we want this? signal to constantly be sent to the heart to keep lowering keep lowering because what's going to happen to our blood pressure we're going to start dropping drastically we're going to be dropping out of that homeostatic range we don't want that so that is the function of the feedback loop feedback loop is once blood pressure gets to the low end of our our homeostatic range what's going to happen to those sensors those sensors are going to sense there's going to be less stretch on them the signal now from the sensors is hey blood pressure's getting low and what can the integrating it can cause stop the output signal that's telling the heart to slow down and telling the blood vessels to dilate okay and that keeps us from going 
too low because it'll stop that response that's helping us drop the blood pressure down. Okay, so you can see how these negative feedback loops are homeostatic. Um, nervous system is one way because we're talking body wise and over long distances. Um, another one is endocrine system. Your blood glucose is controlled by cells in your pancreas, okay, by the endocrine system. We don't want blood glucose to go too high or too low, okay, but you can see how these feedback loops are used, or feed the response loops with the feedback loops are used to keep us and will help regulate our homeostatic range for our various variables. Okay. So this is just a drawing to put in. There's those baroreceptors I was talking about. Here are those afferent fibers bringing whatever information is coming from the sensors to the brain regions. And then we get the integrating center that's ultimately going to send out afferent output signal through the afferent fi fibers to our target tissue. Okay. So that is for negative feedback. Negative feedback keeps us homeostatic, keeps us within that range. Positive feedback loops, on the other hand, are not homeostatic. They actually reinforce the original response. Okay, initial stimulus causes a response, and that response causes more stimulus and causes an increased response. The classic example of this is. giving birth all right when it's time all right gravity starts taking hold and you can see the baby is starting when it's time to be pushed out the cervix starts to stretch that's the initial stimulus that's the stimulus Okay, that stimulates when the cervix starts to stretch, it signals oxytocin release. Okay. That's the output signal. The output signal goes to the uterus. Oxytocin causes the uter uterus to contract. This muscle here starts to contract. And what's that do? It starts pushing the baby down. And what's it do to the cervix? It causes more stretch on the cervix. Okay, that was the initial stimulus was stretch on the cervix. More stretch on the cervix causes more oxytocin release, causes these contractions to be even stronger, causes the baby to be pushed down even further, causing more stretch. So you can see how we're amping up our oxytocin release, which causing our uterine contractions to be stronger and stronger. Okay. This will keep taking place because until there's no stretch on the cervix, this is going to keep increasing. Okay. What happens? The baby finally gets born, and what happens to the cervical stretch? The cervical stretch goes away, and what happens to the oxytocin release? It gets shut down or dampened. Okay. So we need an outside force to stop our positive feedback loops. In this case, the baby being born, it's an outside force that stops this feedback loop, this positive feedback loop from taking place. Okay, so positive feedback loops are not homeostatic. Most women, if you ask them, did you feel fabulous? Did you feel very calm and within a homeostatic range when they were giving birth? They would probably tell you a no. Okay, another positive feedback loop is ovulation okay you most female will tell you using when it's that time of the month and ovulation is taking place they're not feeling very homeostatic so you can see these are positive feedback loops taking us out of the homeostatic range okay amplifying response rather than getting the response up to a range and then stopping it so it doesn't go too high